Hey everyone, welcome back to the Jack Chap Show. And today we're going to be talking about things I like to call wealth killers. For young people and millennials, and they kind of, they're, they're like reasons why a lot of people, especially older people, can't retire. It's not that they don't want to, it's that they, they can't retire. And, you know, just as an example, um, I know a few people close to me, they're in their 50s and 60s, and I actually, they're 50s and 60s, I don't think I know a lot of people in their 70s that, anyways, they're, they're thinking about when they can stop working. Now, two of them specifically, um, well, I guess I should, one of them specifically, you know, about 60 years old, male, been working his entire life at a good $50,000 a year job, hands-on stuff, um, at a, he's kind of a hands-on mechanical, you know, welder, engineer, kind of something like that, right? And he doesn't have assets at all. He owns a car, still rents a house, can't retire. Why? Why, why, why? Well, I'm going to get to that. Second person, female, about mid-50s, maybe early 60s, I'm not quite sure. Mid-50s, late-50s, early-60s. Been kind of like a, a secretary, HR kind of role for decades. Um, made 40k a year, roughly 40k a year for most of her life. Has no assets, can't retire, still rents a house, nothing. Doesn't really have much wealth. Why is this? And how can you prevent yourself from being in this situation where that's just a representative of most, pe most older people right now. Most people in their 50s and 60s right now, they can't retire. They don't have enough in Social Security or RRSP in Canada to retire. So what can you do? Early on, I mean, there, there's different ways to, to fix that. I mean, fixing that for them is, is different than preventing it. So I'm going to talk about preventing it because most of you people are young, and these are some things which they're they're wealth killers. All right, so this is in no specific order, but I'm just kind of going through these as they're the wealth killers for young people. This one is called minimum payments. This is stupid, unless you're unless occasionally it fits an investment, but odds are it's not. So, minimum payments on stuff like credit cards, um, mortgage, car loans, student loans, only making the bare minimum payments is one of the worst things you can do. Now, you don't necessarily have to pay off that debt as quick as you can. I'm actually, I'm a fan of good debt. Okay, so. Uh, like some mortgages, some, some housing investments, if it's your, even if it's your first home, I know a lot of people don't think that's an investment, it's a liability, but if it's in a good spot and it's appreciating, it can be considered for me as an investment, right? But anyways, making the minimum payments for mortgage, okay, like that's kind of understandable because it's kind of like plotted out and if you miss a payment, it gets added up. But like credit cards, so if you were to spend $2,000 for, I don't know, a month, right, on credit cards, right? And the minimum payment you need is, I don't even really know, I don't really use like a lot of credit cards, more than a couple hundred dollars a month, so. Um, but if you were to spend $2,000 and the minimum payment's like 1,300 and then there's interest on whatever you don't pay of 8%, you're essentially taking out loans, is what you're doing. And if you keep doing that, you only make a $1,300 payment or $1,500 and it's $500 left over a month, or maybe even if it's $50 a month. For an example, if you buy $1,000, use $1,000 on your credit card and you only have to pay off 850 of it, right? $150 a month over the course of a decade, that's, you're pretty much taking on another student loan is what you're doing. So that's, that's a giant wealth killer. And I know a lot of young people are doing, especially like some people very close to me, they're only making the minimum payments and the, the debt's not even going down, it's going up. The debt's going up and it's bad debt. So that is one of the biggest wealth killers for young people. So if you can pay down your bad debt as fast as possible. Now good debt could be, you know, leveraging the bank's money to buy stocks. I mean, that's for a lot of you out there. You can borrow up to twice the amount of your investment to buy more stock. It depends, right? Some banks it's only 20%, some banks it's 30, some banks it's, it's 300. It also depends on your credit too and there's investment history. So, 
But for example, if you wanted to buy a $50 stock and you wanted to buy five of them, um, you can also borrow some money from the bank from the bank to buy an extra two or three of those stocks, right? So that that can be good. Same with investment properties like borrowing four hundred thousand dollars for a fourplex where you rent it out and cash flow it. That's good debt. So, anyways, we're gonna get going here. Minimum payments are definitely um, a retirement killer. They're a wealth killer. So, number two is um, living beyond. Your means. This is an obvious one. Most people know this, but don't realize it. I mean, it's kind of crazy how many friends I have that are living paycheck to paycheck right now and not saving any money. Like, if, if people get worried about, it's so weird that it's just a little bit of financial education can change someone's life entirely. I mean, I'm in a completely different position than my friends. And I know I'm making a lot more money now, but it's still like, I don't, I also, it's kind of funny. I make three times as much as the average person my age, but I also probably spend a third of what they're spending on just useless shit, right? So living beyond your means. So that's, you know, I don't know. Uh, what's a good example here for living beyond your means? Just like buying stupid stuff, you know, buying video games, whatever, going on vacations when you don't need them or can't afford them, um, having a, a mortgage where um, it's pretty much on the edge of the stress test. So it's the maximum mortgage that you can get. That's not always a good thing, right? And just stuff like that, like trying to pretend. Also, the, another thing too is pretending that you're wealthy is another thing too, like buying that fancy coat, buying those fancy shoes, buying that fancy car, even though that stuff depreciates the second you buy them. For example, if you were to buy a $40,000 car, that price gets cut almost in half the second that you take it off the lot. It becomes a used car right after it. So it's something to think about, like don't make, don't buy a lot of things that depreciate, invest in things that do appreciate. And that's kind of what I like to think of living you know, kind of living beyond your means is buying a lot of things that depreciate and stuff that you don't need, like buying a food, some food that you're never going to eat, right? I know, for example, my mom used to do that all the time back in the day, and she still kind of does when she just buys, I swear to God, twice as much food as we will ever need, and she throws out whatever we don't after a week, and it's money wasted every week, right? So, it's, uh, yeah, that was back in the day though. That was like, okay. Anyways, we're going to move on here. And number three wealth killer is something I'll just call it choice of location. Choice of location. What do I mean by that? All right. So you're a millennial and you let's just say you're in Toronto. Okay. I know a lot of you are in, in the States, but Toronto for all of you Americans out there, it would be the third largest city in the United States. It would be LA um, or New York, sorry, New York, LA, Toronto, and then Chicago after that. So you're a millennial. You have a choice. You can make $40,000 a year at a job way outside the city, maybe in a different city, in a smaller city like Kitchener or Waterloo, just some you know, average kind of city, or you can make $45,000, but, and you get to live in downtown Toronto. That's a wealth mistake right there. If you pick the Toronto one, because people don't realize living in Toronto raises your cost of living twofold. Like pretty much the rents there are absolutely insane. The cost of everything's absolutely insane. So when people want to live downtown and want to live in the cool hip areas, that's a wealth killer. You don't have to live there. You have other choices. Sure. You may have some dream job there or whatever, right? But you're going to be poor. Sometimes your dream job of being whatever an artist for 40 grand a year, it's not a good, it, it might make you unhappy in the long run because you're not going to have any money left after. So it's something to think about. Choice of location. So in my opinion, investing in cities is good. Like buying property in cities is good, but it's best to work out. If you're, you know, average wage or slightly above or slightly below, it's good to work outside in a different city, in, in a non densely populated urban city, like a Toronto, like a New York, like um, a Chicago, like in LA, even though LA spread out. Right. But 
So it's something to think about. It's try to find a job in a place where there's a reasonable cost of living. And that's, that's big. So choice of location. I mean, you can find just an example here, like a one bedroom condo in Toronto is like two grand a month, right? $2,000. And that's probably average. Might be, might be 1,800, but let's just say $2,000. That's same a downtown one bedroom condo in a place like Kitchener Waterloo, which is, it's a great city. It's, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people there. And it's like, you can, I found one for $900 a month and it's just as nice as the one in Toronto. So choice of locations, a big thing. Make sure you, you choose to live in a place where it's affordable for you. Anyways, moving on here. Number four, we have, oh yeah. <laughs> so a big mistake is um, paying for services. What do I mean by that? Oh, then my marker might be running out here or not. Paying for services. More specifically, paying for stuff that you can do yourself. I'll give you an example. I remember when I was a kid, whenever the dishwasher would break, we would need to call someone, pay them a hundred bucks to come and fix our dishwasher. hundred dollars. Okay. Like we were, when I, when I was a kid, we were really, really wealthy. We were in the 1%. And then, you know, my mom quit her job because we had a brother and she made enough money in her life. And then my dad became a vegetable. So we went from being like one percenters to poor. Like we went from one percenters to, even though we had a lot of wealth, our income was, was poverty. So, and for, for years and years and years until I, until my mom, you know, got another job and then I had to step my game up. So we had to pay hundred dollars to fix our dishwasher. But then when I turned around 15, 16, 17 years old, instead of calling someone, no, actually this was, sorry, this, I was probably 19 years old when I figured this out for this example. Um, I was living in a one bedroom apartment and um, my dishwasher broke. What did I decide to do? I didn't call anyone. I didn't want to spend that hundred dollars, even though I had it because I was working a corporate job at the time. I decided I would fix it myself. So I spent about 10 minutes trying to find the um, layout of the manual for the um, dishwasher online and I found it and I've looked at all the parts and then spent another 10 minutes reading it over and I went in there, I had some tools, I had some, you know, just some cheap screwdrivers laying around and some, I, you know, I didn't, I think that's all I had to use. And then I just went in, went into the back of it, popped up the bottom, had to remove that, had to remove the filter, had to take all the stuff out and then there was something clogged at the very bottom, took it out, put all the parts back together, save myself a hundred dollars. That's just an example. So paying for services, like I know it's good for the economy to pay people for handyman services, but for stuff that you could do yourself, like if, um, I don't know, your sink breaks or sink gets clogged, right? Or toilet gets clogged. You know how many times my toilet's been clogged in my house? We've never called a plumber. I mean, I go in there and I do that all myself. And sometimes I have to put in, you know, the drainage stuff. And sometimes I got to go plunger. Sometimes you got to do like the snake thing. Got to get in there. So, I mean, that's probably saved us thousands of dollars. And that's something to think about. So just learning the, these, these hands on skills can save you a lot of money in the long run. So it is, it is something to think about, especially guys out there. I know girls don't like doing all the messy stuff. So guys, it can save you lots of money in the long run if you uh, can learn some of the skills that you would pay for. Um, all right. So number five here, wealth killer is, um, I'll just say no side businesses. So just as an example here, a lot of people, I know my girlfriend's a good example for this. So she, um, she makes, I don't know. She makes, 40 K a year as a graphic designer. Okay. So she's doing pretty well. And then all of a sudden I was introduced into her life and then she started side business. All of a sudden she's making an extra few hundred dollars a month, which really helps her pay rent and pay for groceries. And so she's been doing that now. And it's an extra few hundred dollars a month may not seem like that much, but everyone, everyone has to start somewhere. And two, like it does help. And a lot of people will go through life nine to five job, never do a side business. And that can leave hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table. And that can be the difference between you retiring and not retiring in the future. So again, that's something to think about. Number six is close. I don't know. It, it, the number six could be the most important, but I think all of these are kind of important. 
Um, number six, oh, and that is messed up. Number six is investments. Lack of long-term investing is, in my mind, it can be like the nail in the coffin for why you can't retire. Because you don't necessarily have to invest in stocks to, to be wealthy. You can just do it in an RRSP, which kind of you know invests in whatever market that you want. But, or a 401k for a lot of you. But um, long, lack of long-term investing, in my mind, that instead of, just for an example here, let's go back to the couple uh, of people at the very beginning of this video. So we have the older gentleman, the older woman. Let's just say that instead of spending a couple grand on rent every month, you downsize, maybe you spend $1,500 on rent a month, put away $500 a month in long-term investing, they could be millionaires right now if they did that, or close to it, I don't know if they would be. But if they started young, they could. So, I mean, that's one of the, the way, like I've talked about this before is, you know, you can become a millionaire through investing, anyone can. If you make 50 grand a year, I've told this, I think I've told the story about the, the janitor that was 80 years old and was worth $7 million only because he started investing when he was 20. And he, all he did was he did my buy and buy more strategy of 6%, McDonald's Coke stocks gets the dividends, reinvest those dividends, buy, buy more, kept going. He was worth, he was almost a multimillionaire when he died. So anyways, that's something to think about. What do you think is the ultimate wealth killer for young people? I mean, this minimum payments kind of gets you into like a debt cycle, the debt trap, which I think I might've made a video on that before, how people get stuck in debt and it's really tough to get out of sometimes. I mean, living beyond your means can be a wealth killer, but if you have a high, actually living beyond your means means that no matter what your income is, you're, you're living high standards. So that could be the number one wealth killer, actually. Um, yeah, but what's the number one wealth killer for you? Like, what's your weakness? I think for me, I don't even know if I have a weak, I don't know if any of these are weaknesses for me. Paying for service, I guess number four. I mean, I do a lot of stuff myself, but... Actually, I don't even know the last time I've paid someone for a skilled service. I think I just try and fix everything myself. Maybe choice of location, because I live in a pretty wealthy area, but I, I can afford it, right? So, I don't know. I don't think, are any of these weaknesses for you? And if you can, make sure you fix them as soon as possible. I mean, for me, I don't really think any of these are, are that. I mean, I guess I could live even lower, uh, even a lower means for me, but... Um, like for example, my minimum payments, a lot of people make, um, yeah, just the minimum payments or make them at the end of every month. If I use a credit card, I go onto my phone and I pay off whatever I just spent within two days, every time. So I don't have to think about it. I mean, I don't wanna be like, oh man, I have like $800 to spend, at, uh, $800 to pay off at the end of the month. No, I just fucking do it right away. It's so much easier. That's what you guys should do. Just pay off your, there's mobile apps for all your banks, I can guarantee it. Just go in, pay off your debt right away. You won't have to worry about it. You'll thank me in the future. So anyways, I'd like to thank you guys very much for watching. Uh, remember to subscribe, leave a like if you want to. And yeah, you are all very beautiful people. I'll see you guys in the next video.